Good morning, everyone at chapel in the room, but also on Facebook and YouTube and online. You know, one of the things in this COVID season has been missing faces that you normally see that are uh, kind of fixtures here in the family. And some of those faces I've been talking to uh, almost on a weekly basis, but Ann Foster and her family, uh, who is, uh, I call her the mouth of the South, missing her mouth. Um, she is still giving me her mouth online, so say hi to Ann Foster if you see her online. But also Mark McCrary and Donna McCrary and Eva Stone, some really pillars of our church uh, that due to COVID are, are trying to play it safe, and we encourage you to do so. Uh, a lot of good stuff going on. If you have your Bibles, you're going to turn to Lamentations chapter 3. You're like, what is Lamentations after the book of Jeremiah, which is after the book of Isaiah, which is after the book of almost Psalms, and there's a couple of little books in between there, you'll find Lamentations. It's not a book we read uh, too much as we kind of close out this series of what does the Bible say about blank. The first we talk about death, what happens when we die, and right after we die, where do we go? What does our bodies, what happens to those? Is, you know, cremation a sin or is it okay to be cremated? We hit all those things. Last week we talked about what does the Bible say about women in leadership and in ministry. Um, and throughout the week I've been posting uh, pictures and little bios of some of the women uh, of chapel that have made chapel who they are. And it's been really cool to see uh, some of the feedback from those things. But today we're going to cover what does the Bible say about suicide and depression? What does the Bible say about suicide and depression? And we did a little poll, and that's kind of how we got these topics and titles. And and I'll I'll say this one is probably the most important one we're hitting right now, because in our world, this is not just a pandemic of COVID-19, but there's really an epidemic of suicide and depression and mental health. And I believe the church has been very, very quiet when it comes to mental health. We've hit things on, you know, you need to be physically fit, you need to be spiritually fit, but, but mental health and mental fitness has been kind of pushed to the back burner by the church. And I think the reason for that is because most of us don't understand mental health or mental illness, so we only talk about the things we understand. Uh, last year, late in the year, Jared Wilson, who was a pastor from Nashville, Tennessee, um, great preacher, great communicator, blogger, all these things. He was an author on the bestsellers list. He also started a ministry called Anthem of Hope for Mental Health Advocacy, helping to communicate to the church and to Christians that, hey, mental health is a serious matter that's affected the church at large. And about this time last year, Jared Wilson, who's a voice and advocate for mental health, who's an advocate for the gospel, who's an advocate of hope and faith, actually committed suicide at 30 years old. And those things shock the world. They shock the church. How can a person who stands and communicates hope and communicates faith and communicates the gospel and even understands mental health and is communicating the need for greater awareness for mental health and mental illness, how could he take his own life and leave two young kids at home and even leave a young wife at home? And his wife actually said this on Instagram after he passed away. She said, my loving, giving, kind-hearted, encouraging, handsome, hilarious, give the shirt off his back husband, went to be with Jesus last night. She said, suicide does not get the last word. I will not let it. You always said hope gets the last word. Jesus gets the last word. I'm going to make sure that happens. Like, like it, those, these things just don't make sense in my mind how somebody who is full of faith and hope and love can actually end up taking their own life. But in church world, it's not just one pastor. There's numerous pastors that every year we see are taking their own lives or dealing with depression and anxiety and mental illness, and we keep looking at the wrong direction. Like even when this topic came up, we had, well, what happens uh, when somebody commits suicide? They go to heaven or hell? That's the wrong question. The question is, how do we prevent people from getting to the place of contemplating suicide? Maybe our message is the wrong message. Maybe our questions are the wrong questions because this is an epidemic that is affecting not just the world, but the church. 19 percent of U.S. adults experienced mental illness in 2018. That's 47 million people. That's one in five people in America, one in five in this room that are dealing with mental illness. Four and a half percent of U.S. adults experienced serious mental illness in 2018. 16 percent of U.S. aged kids, six to 17 years old, experienced a mental health disorder. 
Like, like those are in crazy numbers that one in five people that we meet, one in five people we see are dealing with mental health issues, but yet our question is, what happens if they go to heaven or hell if they commit suicide? Instead of engaging them in their brokenness, instead of engaging them, the Bible says in Psalms 34 that God moves close to the brokenhearted. And mental health has to do with hopelessness and brokenness and despair. And it's our job as people to move closer to them. The suicide rates that are growing tremendously. In 2018, 48,000 Americans died by suicide. 48,000. In 2018, there was an estimated 1.4 million suicide attempts. On average, there are 132 suicides per day. And suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the U.S. More people die from suicide than car accidents. But yet we're silent. 51% of all gun deaths are actually suicides. It's so crazy that depression and mental health and mental illness affects people that the Israeli government and their soldiers, they let all their soldiers take home their, their weapons and their rifles and their pistols and all their, their ammunition. Let them take it home because they could need it at any moment in time in Israel. Their, their suicide rates were so high they could not figure out how to slow down these increases in suicides for all their soldiers. Their soldiers weren't dying on the battlefield. They were dying in their homes with their families. And so they made a decision to not let them take their weapons home anymore, to keep them at the, at the arsenal or on their base or on their post. And when they did, their suicide rates dropped 40% because 51% of all gun deaths are by suicide. More police officers die of suicide by their, by then their own gun, or by their own gun than are killed in the line of duty. If we believe police life matter, we need to make sure mental health matters. Because if more police officers are dying from suicide by their own weapon, then in the line of duty, something is going on that should catch our attention. Veterans have a 21% higher risk of suicide than civilians. Medical doctors have a suicide rate three times higher than the general population. And suicide is the second leading cause of death for teenagers and college students. Meaning it is killing all the people we say matter to us. Our doctors, our veterans, our police officers, our kids, our college students. Like something is going on. And I think the church need to get, needs to get its voice back to address the root cause of what's going on. And so the Bible is not silent about mental health. The Bible is not quiet about suicide or depression. So we need to get back to the Bible to find out what the Bible says. And this is what the Bible says. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 13. So Lamentations, if you don't know what Lamentations means, it actually means a, a cry of sorrow or grief. So God dedicated the entire book of the Bible basically to mental health and depression. And the, the story behind the context is Lamentations, the Hebrews were kicked out of Jerusalem. They were in captivity. They were in oppression and bondage. And they are weeping for there is no more hope left for the Hebrews. And the writer says this in verse 13. He says, he drove into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. And I've become the laughingstock of all the peoples, the object of their taunts all day long. He has filled me with bitterness. He has stated me with wormwood. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. Meaning I can't find peace anywhere. And I've forgotten what happiness is. Sounds like depression to me. So I say my endurance has perished, meaning I can't go on anymore. So as my hope from the Lord. Job dealt with the same thing. And Job said, I wish I was never born. Like there's no hope, there's no life in me left. I wish I could just die to myself. I wish I could just go away and never come back. Some of God's greatest and brightest saints dealt with the darkest, deepest depression. Some of the greatest people we read about in the Bible, 
the ones we talked about in Sunday school class and had their pictures on the wall. We talked about these heroes of the faith actually dealt with depression at almost greater levels than normal people do. There was Job, who we just talked about. Job wanted to die. One, one counselor read the book of Job and said this. He said, Job experienced at least five factors that contribute to depression. Financial loss, death of loved ones, rejection, disappointment, and even physical suffering. And as counselors, often we use various scales to determine depression and its cause and severity. And by any measure, Job's numbers would have been off of the charts. Moses, who we celebrate as this great hero and leader and deliverer, when he leads the Hebrews out of Egypt, they're in the wilderness dealing with all these people. He came to a point of brokenness and depression where his father-in-law had to step in and be his counselor and said, you're doing too much. You can't keep on carrying this much What You need to start delegating and, and sending out some of the work to 70 elders and leaders to help take care of the work. King Saul was so depressed and mentally ill, he was jealous and wanted to kill David who was helping him. It changed the help into hurt. David himself wrote psalms come straight from the pit of depression. Where the psalms make no sense theologically, yet when you find yourself in a broken place, the psalms make perfect sense. You have Elijah who laid by the brook, depressed because he's being chased by Jezebel. Then you have Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers of all time. Had a church of 15,000 people 200 years ago. Preaching amazing message. People still read his sermons today. He told his church, I'm the most depressed member of this church. And there were deep, dark moments of despair. Martin Luther, the great reformer, the same way, had these great moments of darkness and depression and anxiety. The greatest people, the brightest heroes in the Bible had some of the darkest moments of depression. In the Bible, he talks about suicide. There's seven suicides Mentioned in the Bible. Abimelech in Judges chapter 9, verse 52. He's a great leader. And as he was fighting a battle, he was going into a room and a woman dropped a millstone on his head. He's laying there and he tells one of his armor bearers, kill me now. I don't want them to know a woman killed me. Pride and suicide. See, with others, you see Samson as he was breaking out, he crushes the building, lets the building fall on himself in order to kill himself. King Saul in battle dies on his own sword. Saul's armor bearer also laid on his own sword and killed himself. After the pole, hanged himself in 2 Samuel chapter 17. King Zimri burned himself alive in protest. Then Judas, who betrayed Jesus carrying guilt and shame, went and hung him Self. The Bible is not silent about mental health, depression, and suicide. So the question that everybody had asked was, what happens to a person who commits suicide? Do they, do they go to heaven or do they go to hell? And this has been a question for, for years. And I'm going I'm to give you some parameters in order to understand. But this is what uh, one author wrote. He said, for some, suicide is a sudden act. For others, it is a long-considered decision based on cumulative despair or dire circumstances. And for many, it is both a brash moment of action taken during a span of unsettled and suicidal hopelessness. The CDC said it this way, suicide is never the result of a single factor or event, but rather results from a complex interaction of many factors and usually involves a history of psychosocial problems. Meaning, no one just wakes up and randomly commits suicide. There's all types of, of variables involved that involve mental health and spiritual things and economic things and, and social things and biological things and chemical imbalances. There's all types of layers, but yet when it comes to suicide, we just try to cut through and just say, whether well, they go heaven or hell. And there's two extremes. One extreme preaches people straight into hell based on suicide. The other extreme is we preach people straight into heaven that we know ain't going to heaven. I've been to funerals where the person was a heathen to the heathens. They walked not with Jesus through the dew of the morning, but with Satan through the hell of the night. And they lived their life in complete opposition to Jesus and let everybody know it. Yet the preacher said, she's such a godly soul. Right now you can have hope. She's walking with Jesus. 
I'm like, she is probably not walking with Jesus. That's one extreme. The other extreme is, in order to have these great black and white boxes to put everyone in, we just say, anybody who commits suicide, go straight to hell. Here's two verses that give you the two extremes. One, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells within you? If anyone destroys God's temple, meaning your body or your life, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Meaning if you destroy the body or the temple God gave you, God is not happy with that. The other extreme is Romans 8, verse, chapter 8, verse 36, where it says, For I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the Bible actually gives us both extremes. In one extreme, if you destroy your life that God gave you, he's unsatisfied, he's unhappy. That's definitely not God's will. The other extreme, what can separate us from the love of a loving father? Where is this tension and this extreme? And the question would be this for me to answer you philosophically. Are we judged by the nature of our death or are we judged by the nature of our life? Question. Are we judged by the nature of our death, how we die, or are we judged by the way we live our lives? Because what happens is, how you see that determines how you see suicide. One person preaching a, a funeral for a suicide victim said this way, he said, our friend died on a battlefield. Not a battlefield in Iraq or Afghanistan or Vietnam. He died on a battlefield of his own mind, fighting a civil war he could not win. And what he's saying is the manner of death determining where you're at in location shouldn't determine the outcome of your standing with Jesus because our relationship with Jesus is not transactional. Our relationship with Jesus is based on relationship of submission and faith in what he's done for us. And so with all the sins, we, we believe God is gracious God. God is a loving God. God is for you. He's not against you. And we're all relational. But when it comes to suicide, we're like, no, that's, that's the one thing that's transactional. And what we really do is we dismiss any other variables of mental health. If somebody dies of cancer, we don't blame them for dying of cancer. But if somebody dies of mental health, maybe PTSD, clinical depression, deep anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, we condemn them for their mental illness. And the reason is because one is easier to diagnose than the other. I just have something to say, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. But did you know that schizophrenia and bipolar disorder are doctrines of Balaam and a, and a doctrine of the Nicolaitans? And God says that we need to repent, or else he's going to come to us and fight against him with the sword of his mouth. Fight against us with the sword of his mouth. I studied in a PhD program in marriage and family therapy, and one of the first things that the Holy Spirit of God showed me I agree, and I appreciate that, but I'm going to keep on going because I believe both are true. That God is a God of science and a God of faith, and both are at play in every human being. And what happens is we have people that, that count just like she just said, and nothing is what she just said. But God is a God of war. He's also a God of healing. God is a God of peace, and he's a God of war. And God does not come and destroy those who are broken. He comes to restore those who are broken. And there are spiritual things at play. There's medical things at play. And everything, I'll tell you this, everything has a spiritual root to it. Every physical disease, everything we go through has a spiritual root. But it takes both eyes to see clearly. And right now we're in an epidemic spiritually and physically that is going on in our world. And so do we judge someone who is dealing with deep, dark depression, PTSD among soldiers? I've sat with them. And I've had, a, I had another leader tell me this. He said, our people are just more weak now than they've ever been. 
These guys that went to, to World War II and all these other wars, they didn't deal with PTSD. And I said, I told the, I told the person, I said this, I said, the difference is, when you fight on a battlefield, something feels right about the battle. But when you're fighting in a home of somebody else, and these men who go to Vietnam and Afghanistan and Iraq aren't fighting on battlefields, they're fighting in the homes with women and children. And in doing so, they see things they should not see. That causes trauma to the brain, that causes trauma to the heart, and there's guilt and shame from spiritual things. They all have to be addressed in order for anybody to have complete healing and restoration. And so with suicide, I believe, this is what I believe, I believe we judge the fruit of someone's life, God judges the soul of somebody's life. We can judge the fruit of salvation, but only God is judge of somebody's salvation. And so when it comes to anything, we don't get to decide who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. We don't even have a say in the matter. None of us are holy enough, righteous enough. None of us have paid the price to judge someone else. The only person worthy enough to judge heaven or hell is Jesus, the unblemished lamb. The rest of us, we can see the fruit of the tree and we can help prune the fruit and help point them in the direction of producing new fruit, but it's only Jesus who has the ability to judge. The rest of us, our job is to make sure when they get there, they've heard the word enough times, they've heard the gospel enough times, they've seen the move of the Holy Spirit enough times that they're prepared for that judgment day. That is our role because you can have heaven in your heart and have hell in your mind. John Osteen said that, 40 years ago almost now. You can have heaven in your heart, but have hell in your mind. And I believe that's all these numbers we've seen, these statistics we've seen, I believe that's what we're seeing happen today, is that we're losing the battle of the mind and we're losing the battle of the heart for God's people. 2 Corinthians 1 says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. And strongholds are mental strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge, knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ. He's saying there's a war going on for our minds. And when you see Judas, before Satan entered into Judas, in John chapter 13, it says that Satan prompted him or suggested to him. Satan prompted Judas before he ever entered into him. And as he prompted him, he suggested to him a temptation, a thought that Jesus was not doing what Jesus should be doing. And if Judas just betrayed him, it would fix all the problems that were going on. And so Judas didn't just take the suggestion or the prompting. He grabbed a hold of that thought, took hold of it, and he became to take it and place it not just in his mind, but in his heart. And that's how Satan works. He works their spiritual oppression, their spiritual possession. But how he gets to you is through your mind. Through doubt, through discouragement, through hopelessness. He begins to work on your mind by prompting certain things and suggesting certain things. And once you take that suggestion, if you grab hold of that thought and own that thought, it takes seed in your life and it opens a door for the enemy. That every open door of Satan begins with a thought that is contrary to Christ, contrary to his word, that then begins to hold you captive to what the Satan said instead of what God had said. And when you grab hold of that thought and you hold it, it opens up doors and gives the enemy permission to begin working in your life. The enemy, all spiritual warfare operates off of permission. You get filled by the Holy Spirit through permission. You get filled with evil spirits through permission. Through unforgiveness, through bitterness, through the occult, through new age stuff, through all types of things that you give the enemy permission. You open a door, he enters in. As he entered into Judas, Judas then betrayed Jesus based on that prompting or that suggesting that started in his mind. But just like a, a thought opens a door, when you grab a hold of thought of, from God, and you take that thought captive and obey Christ and the knowledge of God. It gives God permission in your life and rebukes all the other things out of your life. That is the battlefield of the mind. Permission. What word are you going to give permission to? The word of God or the word of Satan? 
The word of God or the word of the world? The word of Jesus or the word of your mama and your daddy? The word of God or the word of social media and the mainstream media? Whatever you give open to to that word, you give permission to start speaking into your life. And depression starts with discouragement. Meaning the word of God fades in your life. You start believing your circumstances more than what God has said. And in doing so, it starts to discourage you. Some of you, it could be your marriage. That you knew God had called you to be married. You made a covenant with God. You made a covenant with each other. But as the years have gone, the glimmer of your marriage has faded. And now you're hopeless for your marriage. And depression starts to sit in that you're always going to be like this. My marriage is always going to be hopeless and lacking light and life and hope. For some, maybe it's a chronic illness, cancer, or diabetes, sickness, disease, whatever it may be, and you think, I'm never going to be healed. I'm never going to get any better. I'm never going to get through this. And Satanists keep telling you, you're not going to make it through. And depression starts to settle in. Some of you maybe not being recognized at your job or by your family or at your work or in your career. And you got passed on by promotion and promotion and you start feeling rejected and you begin hopeless because you're discouraged. Or some of you, maybe you went through a divorce and you think you're never gonna have it together again. Or maybe somebody's broke up with you, the boyfriend, the girlfriend you thought you were gonna get engaged to and get married with, and now all of a sudden you think it's never gonna turn around again. That's where depression starts to sink in. Some of the symptoms of depression are persistent sadness or anxious or empty moods, feelings of hopelessness and pessimism, feelings of guilt and worthlessness and helplessness, loss of interest or pleasure in hobbies and activities including sex, decreased energy, fatigue, feeling slowed down, difficulty concentrating or remembering or making decisions, insomnia, early morning, wakening or oversleeping, loss of appetite, weight loss, thoughts of death or suicide or suicide attempts, restlessness and irritability, Persistent physical symptoms that do not respond to treatment, such as headaches, digestive orders, all types of other disorders, is when depression starts cranking in, it affects your physical body. Because every reality we have starts with a mentality. And if, when your mind starts to get weak, when your mind starts to get unhealthy, your body will start to get unhealthy. And what begins as discouragement now becomes this weighing down of life. It's a dark cloud that follows you. And no matter how sunny it is outside, all you see is this dark cloud. No matter how good it may be to everybody else, to you, it's the worst of days every single day. And the only way I can really explain it is Toya loves weighted blankets, which drive me crazy. I already talked about them before. They're like the safety blanket that prevents the husband from enjoying being a husband. And so I couldn't take her weighted blanket from her because she was still using it this morning. But depression is like a blanket. And there's weighted blankets. I don't like it because when it sits on me, it weighs me down. It makes me feel anxious. It makes me feel like I can't breathe. I can't get up. I can't get out. She loves it. But what happens with depression, it's like a blanket that you begin to put over yourself and it begins to weigh you down. And when everyone else is enjoying the summer, you're like, it's hot. It's too hot in here. It's too, I'm sweating. I'm, I'm getting anxious. And it's because you're carrying an extra weight other people aren't carrying. And it becomes this, this weighted feeling, which reminded me this morning when I was in prayer that before I became a lead pastor, they used to tell me that once you become a lead pastor, when you start to carry a mantle, it feels like a weight upon your shoulders. So when you start seeing some of these men of God that are dealing with depression and suicide, it's the mantle, it's the responsibility, it's the burden of ministry, of leadership that's weighing them down. And so with depression, it starts to weigh you down where you're moving a little bit slower, you're a little bit more fatigued. Life's a little bit harder. But then it's also like you start to cover your eyes. And when everybody else sees the joys of life, all you see is the blanket. All you see is the discouragement. All you see is the hopelessness. All you see is the pain. All you see is the loss. All you see is the frustration. While everybody else can see your kid is doing great. It's amazing when I talk to people dealing with deep down depression. They'll tell you. I'll tell them, listen, look at your kids. Your kids are doing amazing. Look how beautiful they are. Look how great they're doing. And they'll, yeah, yeah, but all they can see is inside their blanket. All they can see is what's causing the fear, the frustration, 
the pain, the anxiety. And it begins to weigh them down that even when you try to talk to them and point them to Jesus, all they can see is the inside of their blanket. Depression becomes this blanket that all you can see is the negative things in life. That you can say every promise of God is yes and amen. And all I can say, that may be for other people, but that's not for me. Or you can say, hey, there's hope for your marriage. No, there's hope for other people's marriages, but not for my marriage. Hey, God is a healing God. He can heal you of this cancer. He can heal you of this pain. And all they can see is the depression. All they can see is the negative because the blanket is covering them from the true reality of the life God is trying to give them. And five factors that contribute to it. It's medical, biological. We talked about chemical imbalances, all types of schizophrenia, chemical imbalances, bipolar disorder, clinical depression, all these things, economic and financial. It's no wonder they call economic depressions depressions. They affect your stability and your hope and your future. Sociological, the loss of connection is fueling mental health disorders. Depression increased 300% during COVID-19. And the more independent Somebody is, the worse mental health gets. Meaning as our culture has moved from a community-focused culture to an independent-focused culture, we've seen mental health on the incline because God did not design anybody to be alone. God designed us to do life together. God created family for health, for prosperity, for protection, and for spiritual well-being. Yet we live in a day and age where it's independent. Me, 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 mine, mine, mine. The book, The Happiness Advantage, the whole book, a Harvard professor, the whole book is based on all these kids go to Harvard chasing their dreams and they have the highest mental health and depression rates in America. The sharpest, the top, the best of all their classes, the highest rates. And the whole book, he determines, it's a connection factor that those who live closer to their families had lower mental health illnesses than those who are chasing after their individual independent dreams because depression thrives in isolation but the holy spirit thrives in community psychological the three factors for suicide and depression is one self-hatred meaning i hate myself i hate what i did i hate who i am i hate how i look i hate how i think i hate how i failed i hate what i've done i hate my life it's self-hatred Number two is hopelessness, where there's no hope for a future, even though God over and over again tells us the hope we have in Christ. And there's also guilt and shame. I Meaning I can't get over my failures and my mistakes. I'm ashamed of who I am. I'm ashamed of what I've done. I'm ashamed of what's happened to me. Many of our sexual abuse victims and physical abuse victims and domestic violence victims that deal with abuse, they deal with guilt and shame that drives them into depression and frustration. And what's sad, if those are the top three, we have a gospel that gives us a new identity. You don't have to hate yourself. You get a new self. You don't have to hate what you've done. God gives you a new life in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, you are not the old you. You are the new you. He gives you a new hope and a new future. He wipes away guilt and shame by the blood of Jesus, never to bring it back up against you. He sets you free. The gospel solves all three of those situations. Yet we're not preaching the gospel. We're preaching live your best life now. And then spiritual. That there's a spiritual root to everything we see. That everything physical started in the spiritual. Spiritual oppression is real. Spiritual possession is real. Spiritual depression is real. Demons are real. And they're fighting to gain access to your soul. If they can get access to your soul, they will affect every single area of your life. My deepest, darkest moments of depression, I never dealt with depression before. In 2008-ish, 9-ish, I was going through the greatest spiritual warfare I'd ever been a part of. Ever until I came to this church. This was preparation. This was the practice. This is preseason. And like I'm literally praying. I had this room, our kids' room, I had no uh, windows. I could go up there, turn praise music on, worship music on. I just pray and pray and pray. But I realized the kids were young and I just I couldn't step out of this spiritual warfare. And I'd come home and I'd go straight to my room and I'd just read. Like I'd say hi to the toy and the kids, and I'd just go to my room. I just needed a break. 
And I kept on, and finally a good friend of mine, uh, who's a really strong uh, corporate-type leader, he said, hey, I think you're dealing with, with depression. I said, no, I'm good, man. I'm just going through this thing, and I'm, I'm trying to get through. He said, no, no, I think you, I think you need to go see a counselor. I, I never really, really thought about counseling until this moment. And I go to counseling, and as I'm at counseling, we start going through some of the stuff that's going on at, at this church. And she says, you need to leave now. And I said, no, I got to, you know, there's a transition going on. I want to help you with the transition. No, you need to go now. Next time I brought Toya in, we started going every week for months. And she said, you need to leave now. She's like, this is deep, dark spiritual warfare. And she's like, there's nothing that's going to change by you staying. And I dismissed her counsel and I stayed and everything she said came to pass just like she said. And it was through that spiritual warfare when I was trying to fight alone, that the depression tried to crank in. Once I invited somebody into it with me that had a different perspective than I had, then that depression was lifted and the spiritual victory came to be. So I want to tell you, yes, I, I believe there's some, there's some, the coddling of the American mind. One author said that we're softened in our mental strength these days as a generation. I do believe that psychology does de design and define excuses for every single thing that happens. But I do know that Elijah laid down by a brook wanting to die. And he was not, he was not demon possessed. He was not affected negatively spiritually. He was doing exactly what God had called him to do. And God came and helped him in the middle of his brokenness and his depression to help him out of it. And so for me, my desire is to help you out of whatever you're going through. That's through preaching the gospel. It's getting you filled with the Holy Spirit. That's through deliverance ministry. That's through however we can do it, but also through taking care of yourself. So 10 quick tips to help you when you're dealing with depression or suicide. Number one, do not be so spiritual that you won't admit when you're hurting. Don't be so spiritual that you will not Admit when you're hurting. There's been movements of the prosperity movement that say, you name it, claim it, you never acknowledge, you never confess that. No, no, no. You can't get healed until you confess it. Literally, the Bible says, if you confess your sins, then you'll be forgiven. You couldn't be healed unless you confess that you're sick. That admitting you're hurting doesn't make you less spiritual, it makes you human. Two, stop self medicating yourself in unhealthy ways. Stop self-medicating. We can hit the big ones, drugs and alcohol. You know why there's such a connection between addiction issues and depression and suicide issues? It's because a lot of times they're undiagnosed and they self-medicate. And when you self-medicate, you just prolong the inevitable. But we can also talk about self-medication through porn, through lust. We can talk about it through social media and the selfie addiction where you're trying to boost up your self-esteem by taking way too many selfies that nobody wants to see you all dressed up with your makeup on that close. No one. Three, be intentional about what you put in your mind. Be intentional about what you put in your mind. Just like you feed your body, if you feed it a bunch of junk food, your body will become unhealthy. If you feed your brain a bunch of junk, your brain will become unhealthy. And God has given you the best possible diet you could ever put in your brain. But just like good food, sometimes it takes a little while to get it cooking. And we want such quick, fast food physically. We want fast food spiritually. We want it fixed now. No, no. I read the Bible now because I'm preparing for what's going to happen in 10 years. If I'm reading the Bible right now for what's going on right now, that's called fast food, junk food. It normally doesn't happen. Be intentional. Turn off the news. Turn off social media. Turn off the TV. Turn off horror movies. Turn off music. Put on worship music. Put on preaching. I love old school preaching. John Osteen, not Joe Osteen. Give me all day long. Or Roberts. Why? They're feeding my mind with truth. Four, don't believe everything you feel. Your heart will lie to you. A broken heart will lie to you more than even a lying heart. And when your heart is broken, your heart will try to convince you this will last forever. The pain you feel right now, this rejection you feel, it's going to be with you forever. Your heart is lying to you. Five, don't forget 
that the darkest days are temporary. Don't forget the darkest days are temporary. That sorrows may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. When is the morning? When you wake up. It's not when the sun comes up. It's when you finally wake up to the reality of who God is and who he's called you to be. Six, don't run away from community. Run towards community. When you're hurting, that's not the time to isolate. and get, It's the time to engage with others because that's where the encouragement comes in. Find people that speak the language of encouragement. Literally, this morning, I text about 30 pastors every Sunday morning because I know that's the worst day of the week for many pastors. That's when they feel rejection. That's when they feel discouragement. That's when they feel hopeless. That's when they feel broken. That's when they feel rejected. That's when they feel it. I'm just texting them. Man, you are amazed. God has called you for such a time as this. God has something. For, God is faithful even when we're unfaithful. Every week, text them, encourage them. Why? Because we all need encouragement. Encouragement means literally place courage in somebody else. There's a guy, a friend of mine in, in Ohio. This dude is the most encouraging person on the planet. If I'm ever feeling down, I text or I call Jason. Hey, Jason, what you doing? Oh, man, I'm great. Bob, have I ever told you, man, you were one of the best preachers I ever heard. I, I just preached the worst message ever preached the Sunday before. Man, you, man I love the way you, you love toy. I love the way you love your kids. Man, I just love, man, you're just amazing, Bobby. Like, I, I, and he just encourages you. Like, and I try to encourage him back, but it's nothing like, I feel like it's like a one-way relationship type thing. Find people that speak encouragement. There's enough people that speak discouragement. You can go on social media and be discouraged. You need to find people in the community who speak life, hope, love, and encouragement because your oxytocin levels actually increase through social activity. Seven, make practicing gratitude a spiritual discipline. One of the things that keeps you locked in depression is you, you can't see the good around you. Like you can't see the blessings you've been given. You can't look back and see good. You can't look forward to see good. But if you start practicing five things to be grateful for a day, God, I thank you. This morning, we're having church. I know people all over America that can't meet this morning. We can, can encourage one another. We can worship together. God, thank you for letting us worship together this morning. Father, thank you for the people that you surround me with, even the worship team. Thank you for letting them use their gifts to just encourage your body. Thank you for them leading us in worship. Father, thank you for social media and for online digital presence. We can reach in the homes of people who are elderly, who are at risk, that we can still love them and encourage them. Father, thank you for my family, that even though they're out of school and they drive me crazy, I still love them because somebody has to love them. Father, thank you for your blood that has cleansed me when I was completely unworthy and brought me to a place where I can stand strong and tall and place my faith in you. Make practicing gratitude a spiritual discipline. Eight, get your body moving by going for walks, exercising, and finding a hobby. It's amazing when you're depressed, you just want to lock yourself away, but you get outside, you get fresh air, your body starts moving, your body's healthy, your brain starts getting healthier. Like, there's, I was on a call this week with pastors all over America. One of them lives in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. During the winters, he literally leads hunting guides and trips and all this. Like, he's the manliest pastor in America by far. He said, listen, you just need to get outside. He's telling another guy, you just need to get outside, go for a walk, go ride your bike, and go kill something. Like killing something. Make, he said, we got elk out here. We got deer. We got buffalo. You just kill it. It'll make you feel better. Why? Because you're outside. There's purpose. You're thinking about something besides your depression. Even on Friday, my, my sabbatical, I went to Joe Wheeler and walked my dog and hiked my dog. He got tired. I was like, dude, I'm not carrying you back. Let's turn around. It got me outside. I saw the clouds. I saw the sun. I saw the leaves change. I saw the water. I saw the wildlife. I saw the deer. I saw my, like, it brings life back to your soul. Number nine, pray about it. Like, pray about what you're going. God moves close to the brokenhearted. Pray about it. Cast your anxieties. Cast your burdens upon the Lord. But don't just pray about it. Pray about it and do something about it. Like when you pray about it, then go engage with the community. Then go find a counselor. Then call somebody. Ask somebody to pray with you. Don't just pray about it by yourself. Pray about it and do something about it. Number 10, don't let pride, fear, or shame prevent you from seeking the professional help you need. Our staff, I recommend all of them go see counselors. 
I recommend everybody go see counselors because we have the tendency to look through broken glasses. If you don't know what that means, I, I wear glasses. My, my glasses are broke or my contact is messed up. I don't see clearly. And when you're hurting, you're looking at life through a broken heart or broken expectations or broken dreams. And when you look through that brokenness, all you're going to see is brokenness. And so a counselor, somebody can come in with a different perspective than what my counselor tells me. He says, we have to reframe what you're thinking. You're, you're thinking, but let's reframe it to where, what if this isn't forever? What if this is a season? What if God is using this for a purpose? What if God is using this for good? What if, and you reframe it to get a good perspective about what God is really doing through your circumstances and situation. Now, I do recommend you see a Christian faith-based counselor. We have a relationship with a great one, Covenant. My counselor is a ex-Pentecostal holiness preacher. I'm talking about Pentecostal. Went back to college, got all the degrees, all the certifications. He sees it through a mental health lens, but also through the Holy Spirit's lens. You need both to see correctly. And don't let anybody shame you for seeing the help you need. If your leg was hurting, you go see an orthopedic. If your heart was messed up, if you had AFib, you had a heart attack, you go see a cardiologist. If you're not thinking correctly, why would you not go see somebody who's went to school, who's got knowledge, who's got expertise on how to help you think correctly? And there's only one reason, fear and shame. I'm here to tell you as your pastor, I go to counseling, our staff goes to counseling, our elders go to counseling. Why? Because when you carry a burden, you need somebody to help you see that the burden you're carrying is worth it. Even in Lamentations, he, this chapter three, he's crying out. He's saying, God, there's no hope. There's, I'm despair. There's nothing. I want, you to, I want you to see, skip down to verse 21. This is how he, he changes what's going on. He says, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. He just went from having no hope and despair to now he's having hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. For great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Skip down to verse 31. Then he says, but the Lord will not cast off forever. But, through, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not afflict from his heart to grieve the children of men. So, so this author, he's dealing with depression in the first part of the chapter. And then he discovers his hope again in just a few verses. And I want to tell you, you may be going through a dark moment and a dark season, but that doesn't mean it lasts forever. Just because it seems like there's no hope, it's all despair, you're rejected, you're broken, just like this altar lamentation says, but I found that the Lord is my portion. I found that his mercies are new every single day. I realized that his hope is for me. I realized who he is and who he says he is is not a lie. It is true. And the same can be true for you. And so we want to help you. If you would, I want you to take your phone out real quick. If you have your phone, I want you to take your phone out. Like I said, this is an epidemic going on in our country. And we have a college in town. We know that's the second leading cause of death. We have police officers in our church, in our town. We have pastors. We have doctors. We have veterans. We have people who are dealing with loss and grieving loved ones. We want you to have the spiritual insight. We want you to have a community. We also want you to have help. And I want you to text the word CARE to this number. If y'all throw that up on the screen. Text the word CARE to 256-670-2860. I want everybody to do this. And there's two reasons for it. One, when you text this number, it's going to send you a link that Pastor Anthony made a multiple page document with resources for you for mental health. Blogs, websites, professional 
blogs, all this type of stuff, but also it has in there a link that you can click that'll get you a counseling request form so we can follow up with you and get you into the counseling you need. We send people to Covenant Counseling. We're actually in works with them right now to bring an office into our church that they would have an office. They do their stuff out of our church. I go there. That's who I recommend everyone else go to. We have a relationship with them. We pay for your first four visits to help you get the help that you need. And so when you text this word, it's going to send you this document back. So one, we want you to have the help. But two, instead of worrying about what happens to people when they die of suicide, how about we have resources we can minister to people now? That there's people in your family, there's people in your life, there's people at school. They may be dealing with depression, with anxiety, with suicidal thoughts, whatever it may be. You now have a resource. You can save this to your phone, save it. You can send it to them. And they'll always have access to the link, to the phone numbers, to the blogs, to the websites, because we want to be a church that moves towards the broken hearted. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that you are a God with compassion, that Jesus came and was tempted in every single way. In the garden, he was stressed to the point of bleeding through his pores. That, Father, you understand the agony. You understand pain. You understand suffering. But yet you never failed, never became a victim to it. And right now, I pray for faith to rise up in every mind and every heart in this place. We rebuke the devourer from having access to every mind, every heart, and every spirit in this place. Every open door that has been granted through doubt, through unforgiveness, through bitterness, through broken promises, through pain, through agony, through new age, through the occult, through suffering, through pain. We close those doors right now. Holy Spirit, we pray that you cleanse them and clean out everything that's not from you. Holy Spirit, we pray that you occupy, that you get permission from, that you give them permission to receive your Holy Spirit. We rebuke the spirit of fear. We rebuke the spirit of of oppression. We rebuke the spirit of shame and guilt. And we know that where your spirit is, there is freedom. And we pray spirit move. Move in the lives of your people. Move in their hearts. Hearts of stone turn to hearts of flesh. Move in the minds of your people. Minds that are depraved. Minds that are confused, minds that are full of doubt. Renew their minds, oh God. Allow your word to be the infrastructure of their thought life. Allow for revelation and insight. Allow for rhema words to be the thoughts that radiate through their minds. Father, those who have been scared and ashamed and guilt ridden their entire lives, those done by abuse and victims, I pray that you open up a door for them to step out of the past and into the preferred future that you have for them. I pray, Father, for all those that seek counseling, I pray that you use these counselors as an instrument of your Holy Spirit, who is your counselor, that he counsels them, he comforts them, he heals them through spiritual means and through the means of your people, which are your body. Father, we lift up our police officers and our veterans right now. They carry frustration. They carry the pain, the trauma of seeing brokenness in our world, seeing evil up close and personal. Father, those that have been rejected by certain parts of society, we pray that you encourage them through your Holy Spirit. Give them community that brings encouragement and life and comfort to their souls. Father, for our college students, we just pray a hedge of protection upon them as doubt and stress and worry and concerns and trying to plan out their entire future all comes with them at one time. We pray that you protect their minds, you protect their souls, and you redeem them from the curse of the enemy to fulfill your purpose through their lives. Father, those grieving the loss of loved ones, we pray, Holy Spirit, you move closer to them in this time of need, that you place your hand upon them You speak words of promise, words of future, words of hope, 
words of love, where they feel lonely, you move in and you fill those gaps. And above all, we pray that you receive the glory for every life, every family, and every person that calls upon the name of your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name.